Hello and welcome to Slice of Salona. I am Greg Yatman, and today I have a nice treat for you. We have a special guest, an analyst with over 20 years, probably, well, I'm not going to age him. I'm just going to say over 20 years of experience, um, particularly in uh, wireless, uh, telco, um, IoT. So Dean Bubbly joins us from the UK today, and we're here to talk about a few things, including private 5G in the supply chain. So, uh, um, Dean, if you wanted to give us a little peek into, you know, some of the information that you've received from the various conferences you've been to in the last like, year or so, and now that the world has opened up again, uh, give us some idea of what are people saying about private 5G in the supply chain in particular? Hi, Greg, and uh, thanks for inviting me on the show. And yeah, yeah, it's, I, I've, I've been doing this for a while. But I saw my first private network 2G small cell in 2001. So, yeah, I've been th- covering private networks for 20 years. Um, so, in, when you talk about the supply chain and logistics, um, that is part of, of industry which you, you could almost like think about it as to where do shipping containers go is a good starting point. So it's ports, it's warehouses, fulfillment centers, train rail yards, um, ships, uh, and, and so on. And so there's a lot of different physical environments, and a fair number of them um, are, are really interested in deploying private networks. Um, and I've seen that you know, there's been a lot of emphasis, certainly in, in Europe, um, around shipping ports, um, but also uh, there's a lot of interest in warehouses. And I think you know, you're seeing that also in North America with CBRS, sort of warehouses, fulfillment centers, which are perhaps not con- shipping containers, but packages. Uh, and, and all of these environments have a mixture of indoor and outdoor zones. So you might have the interior of a warehouse where you've got automatic guided vehicles, AGVs, and robots of varying sorts. Outdoors, you've got um, you've got shipping, uh, you, you've got the containers themselves, you've got road trucks that we're familiar with, but then you also quite often have dedicated vehicles in ports, which carry containers between, say, the dockside and the crane to where they get transferred onto normal trucks. So you've got a lot of different sort of moving vehicles. You've got large expanses of area, um, which are not really suitable to to Wi-Fi in a lot of cases, you know, particularly shipping ports. You might have open water, so you've got connectivity to a ship that's coming into dock. Uh, and so I'm seeing a lot of interest in in private 4G and 5G, depending on you know the spectrum available and the specific applications. Is there any particular use case or use cases that keep coming up in those conversations that you'd want to address? Uh, I'd certainly say the connection to the 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 port or the, the either the port vehicles or the automatic guided vehicles in sort of warehouse environments. The important thing there, typically they are owned by the facility. So you don't have to worry about you know, giving SIMs or eSIMs to external contractors. So it tends to be the, the vehicles or the handhelds uh, or perhaps cameras owned by that facility. Um, Initially, that makes it easier. You can imagine in future that they will try and work out some way to onboard the shipping companies or the insurance agents or the all of the other you know, cast of thousands uh, at these sites. But for now, uh, a good example might be um, you know, uh, a really interesting one I heard last week, actually, was there's a, a, a manufacturing facility in the UK, which is actually right next door to a port. Um, and they've literally got to carry containers, maybe only half a mile between one and the other. And the interesting thing there is it's a pilot site for autonomous trucks, partly because not many truck drivers want to go backwards and forwards half a mile, 100 times a day. It's not the most fulfilling job in the world. It's an expensive task. There's a shortage of truck drivers and they've got a lot of choice. And that's probably not a prime contract that you want to have to do. And also, yeah, it's a banner site for dist- uh, demonstrating uh, autonomous vehicles. More mundanely, I'm seeing interest in um, security cameras. Well, both security cameras for, for surveillance, say, around perimeter fences, but also um, cameras mounted on, uh, say, dockside cranes, particularly if they've got remote operators. And, and the remote operators, they might be in, like, if you like, a, an airport-style control tower, but also there's an increasing discussion of using you know, remote workers you know so literally that they may be working from their own home and their own office um which obviously at the moment uh, makes a lot of sense uh, and i'm seeing that in particularly maybe uh, facilities which are a little bit outside of the normal part of the supply chain and things like construction sites um where you're delivering goods or, or maybe even maneuvering machinery on a site 
a little bit slightly adjacent vertical. But so I say anything with cameras, anything with moving vehicles is is a good bet. All right. So you've you've laid out the use cases, uh, the good bets, as it were, for the supply chain. But with with all of the good, there is always the uh, the other side of that coin, which is the concerns, the obstacles. So any concerns yeah. that you're hearing, any obstacles that we should be aware of or we should call out now around the supply chain and using this technology? Right. Well, I'd say what there's two that jump out at me. One is the sort of boundary between indoor and outdoor. Yeah. And whether you would use the same network in both environments. Um, you know, or whether you know, particularly co- the companies will start with you know, the warehouse applications first and foremost, and then they'll extend the applications indoors, or whether they'll start thinking about campus networks straight away of, of looking at the continuity. And there you, you perhaps might be using different technologies. It might be 4G and 5G. It might be 5G and Wi-Fi. You know, there's lots of sort of boundary conditions that you use there because your economics of coverage change, possibly the tools, the expertise, the ownership, and the, even if sort of things like insurance might change. So I'd say that's one thing. And the other I just referenced was the um, – the, the whether the if like fleet of devices is controlled by one whether it's IT manager or network manager or whether they have to onboard you know third parties like you know trucking companies for example or subcontractors uh, and that's sort of you know, it's not really a technology problem but it's a case of how do I give a sim to a truck which might be from a rental agency or um, a person comes on site with a phone and it might have dual sim but it might be locked or it might so so some of that stuff is is uh you know it's not technically that complex but the number of pathways you have to think about is quite large well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. Uh, those folks listening, watching, I encourage you to look for Dean's work, whether it be uh, in person, uh, in writing, or in video. He's a fantastic reference for this industry. He's a fantastic, fantastic resource for us. Uh, so please seek him out. And also, thank you for tuning in. We love to have you watch our Slice of Salona episodes and come back again. Uh, there will be another episode with Dean coming very soon as well. So until then, thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, Greg. Bye-bye now.